Thank you, Professor Avi. May I invite Rima Hamami, Stephen Wagner, Salim Tamari, and Roberto Mazzi. Salim was kidnapped. What's Salim? Salim is out smoking a cigar, probably? He is smoking his cigar. <laughs> what a surprise, right? Ah, oh, yes, Salim. All right, into the uh, next item, our first panel for this afternoon. On my very first left is uh, Rima. Hamami from Birzeit University. Rima is an associate professor of anthropology at the Institute of Women's Studies in Birzeit University, Palestine. Her, research, her latest chapter is Serious Politics, the Activism of Bodies That Count, Aligning with Those That Don't in Palestine, Colonial Frontier. And on further left is the Salim Tamari, I like usually to introduce him as the godfather of social history in Palestine, but today I will introduce him as a senior fellow at the Institute of Palestinian Studies. His latest book is The Great War and the Remaking of Palestine University of Columbia 2017. Next further on my left is Roberto Maze. Roberto is a lecturer in history at the University of Limerick, Ireland. His most recent publication is We Will Treat You As We Did With the Armenians. Kamel Basha. Mazda. I like to call him like Mazda, like nice. Yeah, it's okay. it's a Lebanese <laughs> delight. Zionism and the alleged expulsion of the Jews from Jaffa. Syria and World War I, Politics, Economy and Society, Rutledge, 2016. Further on the left is Stephen Wagner. Stephen is a lecturer of international security at Brunel University in London. He is the author of Whisper from Below, Zionist, Secret Diplomacy, Terrorism, and the British Security Inside and Outside of Palestine between 1944 and 1947 at the Journal of Imperial and Commonwealth History in 2014. The title of the panel is the Palfour Declaration, What Was Meant and How It's Interpreted. I will leave it in your hands, the Chair, Rima Hamami. Um, I'd just like to add a few more lines to the introduction to our speakers. Um, Robert Mazza, who is going to be the first speaker, is a historian of late Ottoman and Mandate Palestine with a focus on Jerusalem. Um, and he wrote a really marvelous book called Jerusalem and World War I, the, the Palestine Diary of a European Consul, um, based on the archives of the Spanish con consul during the period that we're talking about. Um, Salim Tamari, who I think most of you know, and as the man said, the, the capo de capi, uh, the head of the mafia's Palestinian social history. Um, uh, actually a one-man mafia, when I think about it. Um, he is the editor of Jerusalem Quarterly. He was a professor of sociology at Birzeit University. And even though he is a sociologist for the last 15 years, um, he's really, his work has really concentrated on the social and cultural history of late Ottoman and Mandate Palestine, and really focusing on the reshaping of Ottoman Palestinian identity, um, and the rise of modernity uh, during these periods. And he has a book coming out this year. Well, he's got a bunch of books, um, Mountains Against the Sea, Essays on Palestinian Society and Culture, Year of the Locust, um, A Soldier of Syri, uh, and the Erasure of Palestinians, Palestine's Ottoman Past. And this year um, will be coming out his book on Palestine during World War I, uh, the Great War and the Remaking of Palestine. And Stephen Wagner's very sort of interesting focus is on what's called intelligence, uh, political intelligence, which we usually know to be an oxymoron. Um, and his focus is really on uh, intelligence history or the history of intelligence uh, 
in the making of Middle Eastern history, especially in relation to Palestine during the Mandate period. But really, this panel focused on the Balfour Declaration within its time, um, first situating it within the wider historical context of World War I in the Middle East, in the Ottoman Middle East, um, and then focusing on various players and agents, their often contradictory interests and motivations, and how all of these shape the making of this profoundly important geopolitical document. Um, in the first presentation, uh, Roberto is going to give us an overview. Um, you'll see a lot of overlap between yeah. his and um, Avi Schlein's presentation. So he's going to be presenting sort of the main academic theories that have been put forth, um, trying to explain why the British did the Balfour Declaration and how um, different academic interpretations of this, this event um, have changed over time. Uh, then we'll be hearing from Salim. Um, we're going to bring the discussion to the Middle East and Salim will focus on local and Arab reactions to the declaration again in its time. Um, and looking at this through the prism of writings by various intellectuals and local press. Uh, and finally, Stephen's presentation looks at the role played by intelligence officers um, in, in crafting the contradictory wartime promises the British made, uh, which Avi pointed out, the Hussein McMahon uh, Agreement, Sykes-Picot, and Balfour. And thus, uh, Steve's, Steve Stephen's focus is going to be looking at the Balfour uh, Declaration as one of the number of contradictory promises made to various parties within the unfolding dynamics of World War I. Um, so without further ado, ah, uh, organization. Each of them has been told they've got 15 minutes to present. Um, none of them are going to stick to it. Um, but we'll try and make them stick to it. And after each presentation, we'll open up for 10 minutes of question, answer, discussion to the audience. And if we keep that at 10 minutes, then maybe at, at the end of the three talks and discussions, we can try and bring everything together and also um, have a conversation with Dr. Abby Schlein. So without further ado, Roberto. Thank you very much for the very kind uh, introduction. Um, I guess I want to try to answer a few questions. How did historians, pundits, commentators, experts, or so-called experts, better say, interpret the Balfour Declaration? How did they explain the production of this policy? Uh, how did they explain the following implementation? Uh, the purpose of my presentation is to sort of uh, go over in the next 10, 15 minutes uh, um, you know, publications to give you a sense of the various interpretation that have been offered by a number of scholars. Um, we, we are debating uh, this document, and I think it is important that uh, uh, we have a good understanding of how the debate has evolved uh, throughout the last 100 years. Uh, obviously, at the end of this overview, I will give you my opinion, if I can, uh, just to share my views uh, you know, about the how the Balfour Declaration came to be and how it was implemented later on. Um, I think one word of uh, caution, um, obviously there's a large number of books and articles, but not as many as you think really published since the Balfour Declaration uh, about this document and its implementation. Uh, obviously in recent time, particularly in the last probably month or so, the web, uh, internet has been populated by blogs, video, websites, uh, I'm not encouraging you to read any comment section because you might be dragged into some useless battles. Uh, but it's obviously interesting to see uh, how this document is uh, highly sensitive and is really uh, sort of uh, still has you know, sentiments attached uh, from depending on the, the point of view, whether you're on the receiving end or the, or the other end of you know, critiques, comments, and so forth. Well, in other words, the web has become as of now, probably the largest forum discussing the Balfour Declaration. Obviously, I'm not going to talk about it, but I would like to invite you to, you know, 
as much as you can, critically and detached, to look at uh, all of the material that is available online. Now, let me start uh, uh, discussing a myth uh, that widely circulated for a short while after the declaration was released. Uh, already 1917, obviously moving into 1918, some of the new British newspapers reported that the Balfour Declaration was issued as a reward to Chaim Weizmann, who helped the British efforts uh, with the invention of a new formula for mass production, for mass production of acetone, uh, which was a key element in the production of bombs. We have to remember the context. It was 1917. The British were facing uh, some of the major battles on the Western Front. Uh, there was a necessity to in, you know, sort of improve the production of armaments. And Chaim Weizmann, who was working as a professor of the University of Manchester, came up with a formula. Now, certainly the formula enriched himself uh, and gave him access to a number of uh, key British policymakers. But certainly, Weizmann too laughed at this story, uh, as he certainly denied the fact that the acetone formula gave eventually the Balfour Declaration ends Palestine for the Jews. But obviously was very proud of his work and of his achievements, and of course also of his uh, economic achievements through the formula. Uh, to me the key point is that the, the, the whole story of the acetone formula gave Weizmann access to a number of British policymakers I mentioned, and certainly there was a key element in, you know, sort of as we already heard, in the imperialist discourse. Uh, in a sense, that allowed him to connect the Zionist movement to the British government. Now, having said that, uh, and having rejected the myth, I would like to move now to the first work that I'm going to discuss briefly here, which is the monumental work of Leonard Stein, published in 1961. Leonard Stein was involved uh, in the Zionist movement as he was the legal advisor of a Jewish agency, and earlier also leader of a, a war Zionist organization. Now, Stein provided one of the most influential to date analysis of the declaration, uh, which again, influenced scholars in the past, and in a sense, is still influence, uh, influencing the works of a number of scholars working on this historical period and on the Balfour Declaration. Now, here at the back, you can just see a number of quotes from the book, just to give you a sense uh, of you know, his, his writings. According to Stein, the declaration was the byproduct of the war. However, he also leaves some room for personal desire, as Lloyd George, quote, to give the Jews their rightful place in the world, end of quote. What we heard uh, earlier, the, the question of, uh, you know, the morality behind the Balfour Declaration. Needless to say, uh, Stein uh, was aware of the Arab question, but he never really offered any alternative or, in fact, a solution. Uh, obviously, Stein came to be a, a key work uh, in understanding the, the text of the declaration and understanding the context. It is interesting that, in a sense, Stein never provided any explanation. In a sense, his work remained thick and very dry. Um, a radical opposition to the Balfour Declaration was voiced by uh, Joseph uh, Jeffries. I think the book is sold here uh, just outside. Uh, it was a journalist who exposed the declaration as a document with no excuse whatsoever and above all produced by the Zionists, and in some way imposed to the British government. Uh, I always found the analysis of this text uh, uh, very interesting and uh, very much persuasive. There are obvious, uh, obvious issues as historians about its sources, but certainly the analysis of the document is very, very convincing. Jeffries also uh, looked at uh, uh, contemporaries uh, I would call parallel Balfour declarations issued by France and Italy, uh, who had similar text, but also included different kind of uh, words that might have, you know, sort of uh, different repercussions if applied in those forms. Obviously, the British were the masters in Palestine, so those declarations were only um, politically issued to support British rule in Palestine by their allies. Uh, Jeffries, for reasons I suspect related to either anti-Semitism or extreme proud of the British government, seems to place the blame on Zionists uh, alone. Uh, it's hard to understand whether you know, he's too much proud of the British government, so they're not guilty of anything, or in somewhat, some way he was anti-Semitic. Uh, but but his, his view is that the Zionists alone are to be considered responsible for the Zionist, uh, for the Balfour Declaration. 
Now, the, the other work I want to look at briefly, it's the uh, famous article by Meyer Drete, The Balfour Declaration and its Makers, published in 1970. He actually suggests the very opposite. In his words, the British wanted Palestine, and very much so. For their own interest, this is the point. He, he believed that the British already aimed at Palestine, even before the war, and in a sense, this reconnects with this idea of the imperialist discourse of, of the British in the Middle East. Of course, they were already ruling Egypt, so why not extending into Palestine and connect eventually the British Empire uh, with India? So, according to Vrete, it was not the Zionists who drew them to the country. The interesting part of Vrete's work was to identify those who worked at the Declaration, as it was not indeed the work of Balfour alone. Just looking at the press in the last few days, I got the sense that many still believe that Balfour brought the document himself and alone. The reality, uh, as I say here, it was just an accessory to the declaration. He signed it, but behind the declaration, there's an entire cabinet, a number of experts. The declaration was drafted together in London by all of his people, uh, and it was also seen twice as far as we know, by President Wilson in America. So this is a, uh, a sort of a, a team effort. Uh, certainly the, the signature at the very bottom of the letter is Balfour, but we should understand and we need to remember that he was not alone in this effort. Breté also redefined the role of Weizmann, suggesting that he was not alone in his dealing with the British and that the Balfour Declaration was not his or the Zionist personal tri triumph. Uh, in 1970, Verité did not attract many followers, as we can certainly believe, certainly understand from the Zionist side, but I think his analysis is still very mu uh, much actual and contemporary, and, and I think we should go back to this, uh, to this vision of the, the Zionist, of the Balfour Declaration as uh, sort of a, in a larger context and not, uh, you know, the work of a Zionist. Now, uh, a revaluation of the, uh, of the makers of the Balfour Declaration, was then proposed by Yehuda Reinhardt in 1982, so we come closer to our uh, time. Now, his massive article, is a very long article, looks at Sir Edward Gray's proposal of March 1916 to support Zionism. In other words, he's looking again at this colonial connection. Uh, Reinhardt suggests that the Balfour Declaration has roots earlier uh, than 1970. However, when Edward Gray uh, made a proposal to, in some way, support Zionism, uh, the timing was uh, inauspicious. Uh, again, we have to look at the, the context of the war, what was happening, and certainly the fact that at that very time, uh, the British were involved with the Sykes-Picot Agreement, in other words, with the French. So they really couldn't promise the same thing at the, at the very time uh, you know, to the French and then to, uh, to the Zionists. They did later on, but with, with a margin, with a gap in between. Reinhardt reminds us that for British policymakers, the Balfour Declaration was merely a last minute bid to tip the scales of the war in their favor. However, in his words, what makes the Balfour Declaration stand out from so many other documents that were issued by the British is the fact that the British did not back on the promise. And I 100% agree with the fact that the Balfour Declaration, uh, unlike many other promises, should be also looked from the point of view of uh, what happened next. The fact that it was then included into the British mandate is probably one of the most important uh, uh, legacy of this document. Uh, moving to uh, another article published in 1992, and I'm going to reach a conclusion in just a couple of minutes, Mark Levin published a controversial, but to me very important, article suggesting a different approach to the Balfour Declaration. To the statement by Christopher Sykes, which we saw at the very beginning of my presentation uh, on the screen, obviously the son of Mark Sykes, nobody knows why the Balfour Declaration was made. That was uh, uh, his idea. Now, Levine suggests that there is one, but it's not palatable. His analysis suggests that the Jews were seen by the Foreign Office as a collective entity, something that we had also uh, uh, earlier by Professor Schleim. Powerful, pro-German, and ubiquitous. In other words, Levine suggests that the declaration emerged from British modern anti-Semitism rather from wartime policy making. And I must say that we also should, that I would add not just anti-Semitism, but racism 
in general. Now, from this one, I want to take a step further uh, and discuss James Renton, uh, who was originally meant to be on this panel, but for family reasons couldn't uh, make it today here. And Renton accepts the argument of anti-Semitism, but believes there's something missing. Why did policymakers believe that Zionism was the key to Jewish imagination, he asks. We know that by then, only a minority of Jews subscribed to the ideas uh, and promoted by Zionism. The British, on the other hand, imagining the Jews as a national community, understood the Jews to be all Zionist. Uh, it's okay. <laughs> We're just going to turn it off. Now, Renton, in the end, argues that the Balfour Declaration was the result of misplayed notions that held sway within the British official mind during the First World War regarding not just the Jews, but ethnic minorities in general. Uh, Renton has a very interesting comparison with the Irish. Uh, you know, obviously the Irish, uh, was, the Irish question was top on the agenda uh, for the British during the war. Uh, so the declaration was issued primarily, according to him, to enable a global Zionist propaganda campaign to capture the support of the world jury for the British war effort. Now, last but not least, uh, there is a point on religion that was mentioned earlier by Professor Avi Schleim, which I find hard to buy uh, in terms of humanitarian or the Christian Zionism uh, element. Uh, Barbara Tuckman, already from the 1960s, talked about it. One of the most important problems for historians is the lack of sources. And I just want to reach a you know, brief conclusion here with my uh, sort of my view, hopefully yeah, it's the right slide. Uh, I give you a sense of the, the academic production uh, I, I personally worked years ago on the Balfour Declaration. I wrote something I never published because I found it very hard. Um, I never really found all of the, uh, the evidence I wanted. But I can safely say that the Balfour Declaration certainly was the work of a number of individuals, which also means we have to look at all of these individuals in order to understand why it was issued in the first place. Of course, imperial explanation, wartime necessity, propaganda, perhaps even religion, they're all accountable for the document, and they all have to be understood in the same context. And I think this is the real challenge to all of the historians working on this uh, topic. But I think, to, to me, the big question is not why. The real question that should be asked is how the short letter becomes so powerful to be often you know, defined as the really point of origin of the Arab-Israeli conflict. In other words, how did then become the leading principle of the British mandate, and then later on also uh, of the creation of the State of Israel? Was it just uh, racism, colonialism, or was something that we're not yet grasping? So the real strength of the Balfour Declaration uh, unfolded to me with its incorporation of the mandate for Palestine. And though I don't have yet an answer to all of these questions, I hope the next following uh, debate, whether it's just to me or with the panel, will hopefully answer some of them. Thank you. So, um, thank you very much, uh, Roberto, um, for giving us this, this overview that sort of looks at, is it interest, is it pure finest power, uh, according to Jeffries, um, anti-Semitism, Christian Zionism, philo-Semitism, maybe a bit of it all together. Um, I'm allowed to ask the first question, by the way, so I'm going to do that. So um, could you just expand a bit on James Frenton's argument about the role of minorities? Uh, I wish James would be here, but uh, yeah. essentially one of his arguments is that the Jews were understood as a nationality, you know, as a nation, as we heard also earlier, and looking at the Jews as a nation, there was the sense that they, you know, while influencing Weizmann and the Zionist organization in Britain, they would achieve the same goal, whether in Russia or America. In other words, they looked at the, the example of Ireland. Uh, you know, the Irish were understood to be basically everywhere in their diaspora, whether in, the, in Britain or in America, Australia, New Zealand. So as much as they could influence the Irish in Ireland, they, they would spread that influence abroad. So you can do exactly the same with the Jews. Once you influence uh, the Jews in, in Britain, then that can be done 
uh, obviously across the ocean. But obviously this was uh, out of a misunderstanding that the Jews were a nation. Rather than looking at you know, Judaism as a religion, there was this obvious, uh, I, I, I would say misunderstanding, but obviously that was their understanding of the Jewish identity. And of course, Weitzman played into this and you know, eventually managed, uh, as we heard earlier, he, he was a boy. The declaration was made and it came to be alive also thanks uh, to this misunderstanding. So maybe we can open it up to the audience if any people have some questions for Roberto uh, regarding his presentation. Um, Mandy and Imad are going to walk around with microphones. Uh, there's two people way up high on the right. Someone here, okay. I guess. I can't really see much, but... Uh, this oh, was yeah. written by um, Alison Weir. It's extensive the research. She, in her book, she explains that Brandeis, who was one of the Supreme Court judges in the United States, was consul consulted extensively over the language of the Balfour Declaration. So there is duplicity that involves the United States as well. I don't know how true or what is your comment? Uh, absolutely. You know, even starting from the Book of Stein, uh, the, the, the Balfour Declaration was seen uh, by an American delegation, which included also uh, Brandeis. Of course, he was seen, as far as we know from the sources, we have at least one, uh, with also some comments by, uh, made by President Wilson himself. So, of course, there's also an element of uh, an American presence within the Balfour Declaration. Uh, it's still a British uh, product. It was born and emerged into a British context, but certainly the British consulted. And yet again, this is part of this misunderstanding of the Jewish, of the Jewish people as a nation. Uh, one of the purposes of the Balfour Declaration was to influence American Zionism, which was little, tiny, led by Brandeis, but as in Britain, the largest majority of Jews did not support Zionism. So of course, this is a, this is a connection that has been discussed by many, but I, I believe that still in some of the literature about the Balfour Declaration, this is somewhat neglected or just overlooked. So it's a bit superficial. Probably that would require more works in order to understand what is the American impact within the Balfour Declaration documents. Up there. By the end of the day, it's a lot of squat. Put your hands up, please. Keep them up. Just a few questions. One, uh, the impact of there was a consortium before World War I broke out, and the US was the US, for sure, US, Britain, and France. I'm not sure if Germany was part of that, but uh, about building a pipeline, an oil pipeline from Kirkuk to Haifa, which was eventually built and I think completed in 1935. For the French, there was going to be a pipeline from Kirkuk to Tripoli. I see that as a factor. Uh, another factor that I I always raise with my students is uh, the first two agreements were in secret. The Balfour Declaration, seven days later it was made public. That wasn't an accident. I don't have the, the, the answer. Uh, I don't feel comfortable with the answer, but it definitely was made public for a reason. It was conscious, a conscious decision to make it public and not keep it separate. And, and I have a question about uh, the role of, of uh, well, two other points. British banking or, and, and U.S. banking, uh, so if you make it public uh, to gain support for the British war cause, I, I don't know the answer to that, but you know, you're sending it to Rothschild, it's a banking family. And then the final point was, uh, my understanding is that discussions were going on for two years beforehand and conditions changed during the war and towards the end of 1917, you have the, you have the uh, first, the, the, the March Revolution, the February Revolution in, in Russia, and then when you have the Bolshevik Revolution, you have the, the threat at which the Bolsheviks said they would do, and that is take Russia out of the war. Uh, seven of the ten, ten top Bolshevik leaders were Jewish, so perhaps making it public would you know, influence uh, um, Bolshevik um, hmm. tactics about pulling out of the, of, of the war, because uh, once you pull them out of the war, that puts pressure on Britain. So. I think a lot of those other international factors came into play, and maybe you could comment on some of them. 
I'll try to be very brief. Now, I, I'm leaving the economic part of the Balfour Declaration to my colleague that will speak later, uh, Jacob Norris, who actually sort of discussed, uh, I'm using this big word, the blueprints of economic development in Palestine that you can find somewhat in the Balfour Declaration. Eventually, you know, the Zionists were awarded also economic enterprises in Palestine over the Palestinians. So obviously there was an economic project behind it. And it, that needs to be uh, clarified, understood, and put into the context of the declaration itself. I just want to briefly mention uh, you know, the point that you made about uh, the publicity. Uh, of course, you're right. The Sykes-Picot agreement was secret. The correspondence uh, was supposed to be secret, but of course there were leaks uh, all around it. The Balfour Declaration on the country was public for exactly its own purpose was, one of the purposes was to uh, fulfill this idea of propaganda towards jury around the world, whether it was America or the timing was obviously, uh, I'm not, not so coincidental, it was probably on purpose, that happened to be in November at the very moment the Bolshevik Revolution and eventually uh, the final uh, Soviet Revolution occurred in Russia. So there was a sense to use this declaration uh, as propaganda in order to influence uh, you know, the Jews around the world, which again, it's one of the most common topics in anti-Semitism, which brings back to the point, the very nature of these documents should be looked also from the perspective of racism and anti-Semitism. There's not only sympathy towards the Zionist movement, but there's also uh, so all of the stereotypes about the Jews, the Jews that are controlling the world, the Jews that can have influence over the Russian Revolution and so forth. Uh, obviously, we know the end result. Uh, the, the declaration did not have a major impact over the Soviet Revolution, at least. Um, so, in a sense, that's, uh, that's highlighted by many uh, in the literature. Uh, yet again, we don't have a smoking gun, using an American sort of expression. We don't really have the evidence, but we can safely uh, say that the, the, the declaration was also issued bearing in mind uh, propaganda to a number of different actors, not just the Americans or the con constituents in Britain. In Lord Rothschild, in, it's part of anti-Semitism. As you just mentioned, he was the wealthiest Jew in, uh, in Britain. So if you control the Jewish banking, hence you control the rest of the Jewish world. This is anti-Semitism. But he was open, he was accepted and acceptable at the time, even within the British cabinet. So, um, especially Renton uh, sort of brings this idea in that also Abby uh, used, which was that Weizmann and co were basically making huge claims um, to the British government on the weight and size of the Zionist movement. And it, it links to this question of the fear of Russia pulling out um, and the need to bring America in. Um, um, and I, I think what I, I find two things fascinating is this kind of crossover between the anti-Semitism, right? So Jews are really powerful in Jewish money and banking with this crossover of the notion of like a really strong Zionist movement, which in fact, Renton's argument, and I think it, it's also Abby, your argument, which is that um, in, in the case of the Balfour Declaration and the Zionist, Zionist movement, you have to put the cart in front of the horse. But in fact, it was the Balfour Declaration that gave a huge growth to the Zionist movement, not the other way around. The Balfour Declaration didn't happen because um, there was a really huge, powerful uh, uh, Zionist movement. So this is sort of a series of not quite sure if I'm asking you a question or making a comment. No, but you're making a very good comment. In a sense, uh, what uh, Professor Schlein was uh, saying earlier, and I concur, it, it really, the Zionist movement was not as strong as it has been depicted by a number of uh, uh, scholars in earlier time. It was, a, it was a movement, and we have some very good scholars here of the, of the Zionist organization and movement. It was on the brink of collapse uh, during the war. The, the movement was split. Uh, it was, for the most part, based in Germany. Uh, obviously, now they found themselves on two different sides. The movement in Palestine itself was suffering as a result as a result of this division. There were political divisions within the movement. So Weizmann was able to sell uh, something that, that was collapsing but, at the time. So in a sense, maybe they wanted to buy, and that's why uh, it's so easy to sell. <laughs> I guess they wanted to buy again for the wrong reason, though. 
the roots of uh, the Buffalo Declaration to me are still there into anti-Semitism and racism, this idea of the powerful Jew. Wonderful. Any more questions for Roberto? Okay. Oh, there's one. And there's one. In our times, there was an S added to the BD. It becomes BDS. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, I just want to mention that the people who were most vociferous in opposing the previous BD were the Jewish members of parliament. Because they said, keep our people outside your dirty manipulation. I, I agree with you. It was mentioned earlier that some of the British official, Edwin Montagu, uh, because he was part of a cabinet, okay. he was uh, vocal against the Balfour Declaration, and, you know, as a Jewish member, and many other Jews were certainly vocal against the Balfour Declaration. So yet again, that tells us this document has a little to do with Zionism, but much more to do with uh, British perceptions and British imperialism, rather than Zionism itself. The, the underlining point was, is, and again, most of the literature concur on that, the, the Jews were understood as a nation, hence you promised them a national home in Palestine. So uh, regardless whether you know, they were talking about uh, Jews in Russia, Jews in, uh, uh, in Britain or Germany, the, the whole point is that the fact of sharing this religious identity made them one nation. And in a sense, I still believe that many believe you know, Judaism is a religion associated with a nationality, which I find it extremely problematic because then it would be the same with Christian, Muslims, or any other religion. Uh, but this was the misunderstanding, and, and again, it's still a, a problematic one. Uh, you know, how we also have to contextualize this into the early 19th, well, sort of the early 20th century, which was the century of emergence of nationalism, and so the production of these doctrines about uh, uh, national identity, which also have to be, under, they need to be understood into this idea of a sort of uh, hierarchical structure. Uh, it was mentioned earlier, there was a sense of uh, there are races that are exactly at the top and those are in the middle and those are at the bottom of civilization. Uh, so the Jews were seen as a nation, it was uh, convenient. They hadn't, I mean, I guess for the British, but for the French and all of, for all of the other European countries, it was essentially an expedient and, and again, it, it was about this nearly 2,000 years of anti-Semitism. They are separated from the rest of the population because of their beliefs, their practice, also their language, whether they spoke Yiddish, Latino, and so forth. So it was okay. certainly very convenient to keep them as a separated nation. Thank you, Roberta. Yeah, so now we forward. will move on to the next presentation. Oh, uh, final PowerPoint. Hmm? Oh. Okay. Thank you. I'm my slide. I hope you'll allow me to speak from here because my uh, presentation is on the board. I can't see it from there. <laughs> um, I'm going to discuss the impact of the Balfour Declaration on the native population of Palestine and the Arab regions of the Ottoman Empire immediately after its issuance. And one of the most interesting discoveries, uh, one of my great uh, obsessions, if you like, is reading diaries and memoirs and going over the main diaries which were written during that period. Uh, people like Muhammad Azza Darwazi, uh, Khalid Sakakini, Rustam Haydar, um, Salim Slam. It's very little mention of Balfour at the time. And there's mention of Balfour retrospectively, and there's a lot of mention of Zionism, but the occurrence of Balfour at the end of the war, uh, remember 2nd of November uh, 2000, uh, uh, 1917 was just weeks, if not days away from the bombardment of Jaffa and Gaza by the British fleet and the entry of the British army into Palestine in early December. So we're talking about two or three weeks difference. And the whole region was engulfed with the bitterness of the war, the famine years, uh, and especially the dismemberment of Syria uh, 
after the uh, uh, Sykes-Picot agreement. This was the overarching uh, feeling that you can see from the diaries written about the time. And I want to start with a picture that is a very unique picture that comes from the German archives. It has never been published uh, of a demonstration that occurred in the Moristan of Nablus. This is the government hospital Nablus. And this occurred at middle of December 1917, after the fall of Jerusalem to the British forces and before the northern part of Palestine was uh, taken over by the British. The Ottoman army was still there. There was a massive demonstration of young men, and some of them old actually, uh, holding the Ottoman flags and the banners of the Fourth Imperial Army uh, and uh, denouncing the British occupation, calling for uh, jihad against the, the forces of the West, of the French and the British armies. I will come back to this at the end, and I want to stress that immediately after the issuing of Belfort, uh, almost one week later, in uh, December uh, uh, 1917, the Jewish Chronicle had, was the first paper to publish the terms of the Belfort Declaration in London. al muqattam which was a pro-British Arab newspaper in Cairo, uh, published the terms of the uh, Belfort Declaration, was the only Arabic papers to do that. And within days, there was a massive demonstration in Cairo and Alexandria by the Jewish community and in which Jack Mosseri and uh, members of the, of the Egyptian parliament spoke welcoming the um, Belfort Declaration. And this invited reactions throughout the Ottoman, the remaining part of the Ottoman Arab lands against this uh, attempt to dismember Palestine from the Sultanate. Uh, the point is that the, most of the people were oblivious to this. They were oblivious for the, mem for the reasons I mentioned, namely that Palestine and Syria, and especially Mount Lebanon, had just come out from a very bitter war in which uh, hundreds of thousands of people were killed, in which uh, ethnic minorities were being liquidated, in which the famine still had effect on the urban economy and a huge loss by the urban uh, adult uh, population who either died in the front or were taken by Safar Barlet and never came back. The earliest responses to uh, Sykes-Picot were seen in the form of demonstrations which began in Jerusalem and Jaffa and later in Nablus uh, against uh, the Sykes-Picot agreement, and especially against the dismemberment of Palestine from Syria. And one feature of it was the publication of uh, a, a newspaper called Southern Syria by Arif al-Arif and Ahmad Buderi, who stressed the main reaction of the Arab intelligentsia at the time to the dismemberment of Palestine from Syria and from the uh, Ottoman domain. Basically, they thought, if we are going to be independent of the Ottomans, we should be also independent in our region. And one reaction to Balfour and to Sykes-Picot, and the two obviously are very much related, was that uh, Palestine is southern Syria. It's an essential part of Bilad al-Sham. Any attempt to separate it would put us at the mercy of the British intention of to implement the idea of a Jewish national home uh, in a separate part of the homeland. So in a way, it was a paradoxical reaction to the demand for Palestinian independence by asserting the organic unity of Palestine with Bilad al-Sham, with, with Syria. Uh, this is one of the earliest demonstrations in Jerusalem uh, in which uh, we see in the middle Arif al-Arif addressing the crowds, uh, asserting that uh, 
Palestine is southern Syria, and with banners uh, showing different parts of the country from Tulkarim, Jenin, Haifa, Akka, uh, and there's a little sign which says Beit Sahur. Uh, the most systematic attack on the terms of the Balfour Declaration uh, came from the pen of Najib Nassar, who was the editor of Al Carmel. And he had already started uh, linking the idea of Jewish national home with the purchase of land by European Jews and the establishment of Jewish colonies. He himself was part of a, a bond of activists who had invested uh, some of their energies in purchasing agricultural land in the Jordan Valley, especially in the Bissan area. And he and Jubran Kuzma, who belonged to the, uh, what is known as the late Arab Renaissance, began to publish uh, articles in defense of the uh, peasants of the Jordan Valley who were being uh, pilfered by both the government liquidation of uh, their land and by the Zionists who were buying to establish colonies in the Jordan Valley. And this was the trigger of this move against Balfour and against the terms of, uh, of the Zionist movement. <coughs> he was termed as Majnoon al Sahyuniya, because at the time, uh, the obsession with Zionism as a target for the separation of Palestine from Syria was confined to very few intellectuals. Most importantly, uh, Jubran Kuzma from uh, Nazareth and Najib Nassar from Haifa, and the organ of this uh, sustained campaign was al Carmel. Uh, at the same time, we see that uh, Arif al-Arif, who was prisoner in Siberia during the war and escaped immediately after the Bolshevik Revolution, came through Manchuria to uh, Jeddah. From Jeddah, he joined uh, Prince Faisal or King Faisal in uh, Jabal al-Druz and then began to publish a, a newspaper called Surya al Janubiya, Southern Syria, referring to Palestine, an attempt to stress the organic unity between Palestine and Syria. Uh, we see Arif al-Arif again. Uh, this is his uh, carte de visite, announcing him as the editor of uh, South Syria. And here he is in Jaffa Street addressing the crowd. This is a very bad uh, uh, picture, but he's, I can assure you that he's, that's, he, he's there in the middle addressing the crowd against the uh, terms of the Balfour Declaration. But this happened in February 27, 1920. So we're talking about uh, two years since the issuing of the Balfour Declaration. The situation was different with the local Jewish community. The Jewish community in Jerusalem was headed by a man called Albert or Ibrahim Antabi, who was the deputy head of the Red Crescent Society, which was a society bringing together Jews, Christians, and Muslims in support of the Ottoman war effort. And he, like many members of the Sephardic community in Palestine, were weary of any attempt to question the loyalty of the local Jewish population to the state, on the one hand, or to uh, create a wedge between them and their relationship with the Arab Muslim and Christian community. Uh, the other organ which expressed the interests of the local Jewry is the newspaper uh, HaHirut, which is very different from the later Hirut, uh, that was the organ of the revisionist, Zionist revisionists. Uh, this is a paper that uh, our colleague Abigail Jacobson uh, wrote extensively about, and it showed the ambivalence within the Jewish community about the terms of the Balfour Declaration at the time, even though 
this uh, particular group was not anti-Zionist, but they were ambivalent about the terms of the Balfour Declaration for the reasons that I mentioned. Nevertheless, in Palestine, we have, this is uh, Albert Antebi. Uh, in, in Jaffa, we have uh, the beginning of issuing local newspaper in Arabic that were pro-Zionist. And it's very interesting to look at these newspapers because it undermines the idea that the Zionist, anti-Zionist divide among the Jews separated the Ashkenazim from the Sephardim. Actually, a great number of Sephardic intellectuals uh, supported the Zionist project, but they thought that this is a Zionism that should not either question the loyalty of the Jews to the Ottoman state or uh, put a wedge between them and the Arab population. So it's a different Zionism that emerged later. Saut al Uthmaniya was a, an organ which was headed by uh, Nassim Maloul, Shimon Moyal, and his wife, Esther al Azhari, uh, who was also an active Arab uh, uh, feminist, but all of them working in the newspaper that Isa al Isa called a paid organ of the Zionist movement. Uh, and a great deal of litigation court cases took place in 1915, 16, and 17 uh, between uh, Saut al Uthmaniya uh, and uh, Isa al Isa, who headed the other anti Zionist paper in Jaffa, Palestine. Three minutes. Uh, so by 1922, the commemoration of the Balfour Declaration took the form of strikes, which were uh, uh, commemorated with uh, the black flags that you see in the old city, and the strikes extended from Jerusalem to Jaffa, the two centers of anti-Zionist activities, also to Akka, Haifa, and eventually to Nablus. And in 1922, we see the entry of uh, middle-class Palestinian women uh, in the Arab Women's Union against the Balfour Declaration. That was the first entry of the women's movement into the arena of public politics. We see here Tarab Abdel Hadi and Sadij Nassar, who was the uh, women's editor of Al Carmel and the wife of Najib Nassar. There was a very interesting episode of the creation of the Arab Party in 1919, which was a a self-termed Anglophile party headed by Jubran Kazma and Najib Nassar, whose aim was to create an anti-colonial uh, tendency that was also pro-English. Uh, they called themselves the Anglophile party, but uh, self-styled anti-imperialist and anti-Zionist. It was a very um, uh, naive attempt to mobilize British public opinion against Zionism in the interest of the British uh, elements against uh, Balfour. And finally, uh, I want to bring in uh, the impact of what is known as the Zakharov Affair uh, uh, on the possibility of reversal of the Balfour Declaration in, uh, inside Palestine. Zakharov was a very uh, uh, not suspicious, but a very enigmatic uh, arms dealer of Greek-Turkish origin. His name was Zacharias. Uh, 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 what was his name? His name was Zacharia, Basil Zacharia, and he changed his name to Zakharov to give himself uh, Russian protection. And he was heavily involved in armament dealings during the First World War and after. He concocted a deal which was revealed most recently by the uh, opening of the British archives and uh, uh, in which the, uh, the English uh, were interested in making a deal with the Ottoman state and the dialogue with, with Anwar Basha, who was a, a very prominent member of the Committee of Union and Progress, to end uh, British terms of the mandate on Palestine and return uh, Palestine to Ottoman control, but in an autonomous uh, 
fashion. And the many people of the within the cabinet were interested, including Lloyd George, but the attempt proved to be futile and it collapsed uh, at the end because of the heavy weight of uh, uh, those elements in the parliament uh, in the in the cabinet that we discussed earlier who sabotaged this possibility and the reason this uh, i mentioned the Zakharov affair uh, is because of what Tom Segev called what if in terms of reversal of history. And what is interesting about the Zakharov affair is that it sort of underlines what Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi two years ago when he reached Raqqa, and it was only two years ago in 2015, he said, this is the end of the, um, uh, the Sykes-Picot agreement. And of course, now we are in November 2nd, uh, 2017, just two years later, and we see the collapse of ISIS. But one feature of Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi's announcement is a reference to the fragility of borders that was generated by the First World War, the end of the empire, and the attempted implementation of the Sykes-Picot Agreement. And I'm not sure why Abi Shlaim said that uh, Balfour succeeded, but uh, the, the, the Sykes-Picot Agreement failed. Actually, it was not implemented in the way it was conceived, with parts of the Ottomans given to the Italians and the Russians, uh, and then uh, Anglo-Franco-British uh, uh, division with the rest. But a, a major feature of the contours of the land that we see in the Middle East today goes back to this period. And one feature of the statement made by Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi is the fragility of borders. And the fragility of borders is not only resulting from the rise of ethnicity, the demand for Kurdish independence, but significantly the assertion by the Israeli state to engulf all what remained of Palestine. And in doing so, given this background, 100 years later, the Israeli state is not only undermining the possibilities of the legitimacy of greater Israel, but of the Israeli state itself. And on this note, I end and thank you. Okay, we're going to take some questions from the audience. Questions from the audience. Okay, and yeah. Uh, just wait for the person with the microphone, please. Ustaz Salim Tamali, maybe you mentioned that uh, the Palestinians were oblivious uh, regarding uh, Balfour Declaration. I just wondering if this is because uh, the Palestinians focused on Zionism more than what the British was doing. Um, uh, if this is so, uh, then one can remember the early um, warning against the Zionism by Najib Azouri, 906, and the letter of Yusuf Ziyah Khalbi, his discussion with Herzl before that, 1913 uh, study that was done by uh, Rohit Khalbi about Zionism when he visited all the Zionist camps, uh, Zionist settlements in Palestine. So can we say that the Palestinian focus was mainly on uh, how to fight against Zionism more than uh, how to attack the British with the idea that we might cooperate with the British in order to end the Zionist project. Is this making sense? I don't know to, to understand what the, uh, the position of the Palestinians at that time. Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, when I said oblivious, to the Balfour Declaration, I did not mean they were oblivious to Zionism, as you uh, illustrated. There was a lot of writings, including Najib uh, Nassar, Isa al-Isa, Azouri, and of course, earlier, Ruh al-Khaldi and Yusuf Diyah. All of them had addressed the question of Jewish emigration, the creation of a Jewish national home, and Zionism. What they were oblivious to is the actual embeddedness of the terms of the Balfour Declaration within 
uh, the mandate. And the reason for that, as I mentioned, was because they were totally uh, overwhelmed with the conditions of the war and the dismemberment of Palestine from Syria. And also, since the Balfour Declaration was not actually made public, except in a very surreptitious form in the early uh, period of military rule. Remember, there was, for three years, a military government in Palestine between the fall of Jerusalem to Arambi in 9th of December, 1917, until the declaration of the mandate. And the Balfour Declaration was not part of the uh, terms of the military government, it was part of the mandate. So the reason for this obliviousness is certainly not that they were uh, not aware of uh, Zionism, but that they were not aware of the explicit nature of the, of the British mandate with the uh, Jewish National Project. Um, I think one of the, the really interesting things that you're saying, and it's not, it's not all about lack of knowledge, um, not knowing about um, the Balfour Declaration versus knowing about Sykes-Picot, because Sykes-Picot, the knowledge of it was leaked by the Bolsheviks, right. which is almost exactly the same time that Balfour came out, so it was November, right, right? but maybe a few weeks after. So the knowledge of Sykes-Picot actually comes out almost exactly at the time that Jerusalem falls, right? Um, but what you're also saying is that what people cared about at the time was much more the dismemberment of Greater Syria, um, and that maybe this idea of a Jewish home in, in Palestine it was just way too abstract, but the dismemberment of, yeah? I, exactly. Okay. <laughs> Another question? Is there any comment about the Hashemites reaction to the Balfour Declaration? That's a very good question. Uh, one feature of the uh, reaction to Balfour actually was a split within the Syrian national movement in Damascus over the uh, hierarchy of struggles that were to be done following the short-lived Faisali government in Damascus. And the Hashemites at the time thought that opening a front against the British and the terms of the Balfour Declaration would, should be secondary, or not at all, vis-a-vis uh, -vis their struggle with the French mandate. In other words, after the Battle of Maisaloon in June 1920, the, the Faisali movement and the Hashemites thought that the main struggle should be for the assertion of the Arab Kingdom in Syria and its independence, as promised to them by the McMahon uh, correspondence, and in which they felt betrayed by the British by them being handed to the uh, French. So a split occurred between, within the uh, Syrian national movement, in which the Palestinian segment and part of the uh, of the Syrian national movement, including people like Asali and Mardan Bey, felt that the struggle against Balfour, against the implementation of the Jewish national home, should take equal uh, value as the struggle against the French and the uh, defense of the Syrian uh, kingdom, the Arab Syrian kingdom. And the Hashemites disagreed with that, and they felt that we should first preserve the Syrian kingdom, and then the, the struggle against Balfour should take a secondary role. So this was the earliest reaction uh, of the Hashemites, the question of, of Balfour, that I know of. Okay, thank you very much, Salim. I think we need to move to the final speaker, and maybe at the end we'll have time for some more questions. Um, uh, create who, who contribute to Britain's three in notorious promises to Arabs, to the French, and to the Jews over Palestine. Um, only by August 1919 do they realize that they have a conflict brewing 
So that seems relatively late for a surprise, and it was counterintuitive to me. Um, and so this presentation comes from how I've tried to uh, explore that problem. So it's only August 1919 that you start to see them saying that we'll have to implement the Balfour Declaration by force against the wishes of the majority of the population. And my approach here is more that of um, history of the First World War. These three promises uh, obviously affect and help create the conflict here, but uh, certainly in their own context do not revolve around um, the Middle East, but more the war, the world war. Um, Intelligence officers, and the reason why I'm focusing on them, they are the main mediators of information between policymakers, the creators of the information, and they um, also are in charge of implementing some of Britain and also France's policies, especially when it comes to propaganda. So coming back to the issue of why these people were surprised only by August 1919, um, we can look at the way wartime propaganda worked. And what I'm arguing is that it's an anachronism, actually, to assume that they were all inherently contradictory, because uh, that depends on how the war was going to end, and of course nobody knew how the war was going to end until the war ended. Um, we are dealing with a context, a military context, that between the first and final hundred days of the First World War, um, no particular side could expect to have a total military victory. No one expects to be able to dictate the terms of peace at a peace conference. And certainly all powers, all belligerent powers, expect uh, their opponents to survive the war and to be present at a peace conference where you're going to have to negotiate with them on the future order after the war. You also expect them to continue to threaten your interests wherever they may be. For Britain and for the ter terms of our discussion, we're talking about uh, Basra and uh, the Suez Canal, of course. So we're talking about a time when no one's having a good war. More bad news keeps coming in, especially for the British and the French, and especially by the summer of 1917. And one of the things that the British and French do in the, since the end of middle to end of 1915 is to promote the rights of small nations as a way of influencing a peace conference where you're going to have to negotiate with Germany and the Ottoman Empire, who, of course, you expect will survive the war. Which brings me to this map here, the only map, I think, that really actually helps explain uh, the, the post-war order. So this was included in the British and French response to President Wilson's uh, efforts to, to mediate peace between the belligerent powers. This was before the American entry in the war. So in their no thanks reply, which is much longer than no thanks, of course, um, they included this map asserting um, through its uh, particular color coding, of course, that this war won't be over. The conf you might bring an armistice, but the conflict won't be over until all small nations have the right to self-determination. So what we normally think of as a Wilsonian promise actually had its origins in British and French wartime propaganda. It was meant to create bargaining chips at a peace conference with Germany and with the Ottoman Empire who you expect will survive the war, and who you expect will still want to dominate the Middle East where you have interests. You'll notice, of course, this is based on, um, this is based on an ethnography, um, I think a German ethnography from before the war. Uh, they can, the color coding conveniently ignores Russia, because um, it's uh, an ally to Britain and France. It also uh, glosses over many other things. I don't know if it's visible, but in the part where Palestine is, it does actually identify Zionist colonies, um, which I think says a lot about the attention Zionists were getting in Britain and France at the time. This is December 1916. 
So what do they want? What's the point here? Well, throughout 1917, before and after the Balfour Declaration is issued, Mark Sykes says again and again to all the other intelligence officers he's corresponding with that what uh, British strategy is aiming for is an Armenian-Arab Zionist combine to, against the Germans and the Ottomans. And he's talking about um, a front against them at the peace conference and also afterwards. So having some kind of reconfiguration of the power structure in the region, but also simply crowding out uh, German and Ottoman claims uh, at this peace conference that never happened. Um, and I should add that the Arab Revolt is part of the same type of small nations propaganda. The, so is um, the Czech Legion and Thomas Masaryk's march through Eastern Europe, and so are many, many other small nations movements, the, the Polish national movement and the Yugoslav, like South Slav uh, kingdom. Those, those all came out of this exact same process. So then we have this clash with reality after the war, because in those final hundred days of the war, we see the rapid and dramatic implosion of the four empires, uh, the German Empire, Ottoman Empire, Austro-Hungarian Empire, and of course, uh, Tsarist Russia uh, succumbs to revolution. Suddenly, um, small nations are not simple bargaining chips, but are actually present at the Paris Peace Conference, whereas uh, these four belligerents of the war are no longer present, and some of them don't even exist anymore. Um, Britain and France, for their part, are free to assert their imperial interests along the lines that Avi was discussing before. And moreover, uh, especially once the Americans leave the concept of the League of Nations to Europe towards the latter part of 1919, uh, Britain and France are all the more able to um, treat the post-war order through their colonial interests and to use internationalism and legal internationalism as a way of asserting those interests. And that's where, um, and it's important to make this distinction, uh, the Zionist, uh, sorry, the, the Zionist policy or the Balfour Declaration becomes implemented into international law and the constitution of the mandate. So there are two different processes, one being the origin story, which I'm talking about here, and the other, how that became the pretext or the justification for this uh, mandate as a legal instrument. Um, I'll summarize now. My argument is also that we're dealing more with accident than deliberate double crossing. And I'm not trying to contradict my colleagues completely, but I would assert here that it's impossible to know whether uh, we, Britain and France would have double-crossed the, their wartime junior partners uh, had the Germans and Ottomans survived the end of the war. Um, the post-war disappointment and the calamity which ensued is rooted in the very rapid and radical transformation of this geopolitical order following uh, the final hundred days of the war between September and November 1918. And the intelligence officers who helped craft those three promises to, uh, for an Arab kingdom, uh, for British and French spheres of influence, and for a Jewish national home, whatever that meant at the time, um, they are now responsible in the post-war order for implementing British policy. And because of what's going on in Paris and in London, that includes implementing the Balfour Declaration. So automatically you have conflict happening in the army between Zionists and non-Zionists. Uh, British officers, of course, but um, uh, th there's growing discomfort with what this actually means because they have to define it. Which is why it's only by August 1919, after months and months of censorship and suppression of disturbances, thanks to help with uh, Zionist intelligence cooperation, um, do we see the realization that there is a zero-sum conflict 
brewing here. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, we have a question way up high in the back back. Thanks very much, Stephen. Really, really interesting, and you more than kept the time. Hi. Um, I just wanted to ask, uh, the Arab revolt that was led by Sharif Hussein played a key factor in this entire instability of the region. But my question is, uh, was there any opposition to Sharif Hussein's uh, revolt? Were there any Arabs that didn't agree with what, he, what was he was doing? The majority. Yeah. And what were they doing? How come he had power to do such a revolt that most people didn't agree with? So the majority of um, Arabists, let's call them, because we're dealing with an era of proto-nationalism or nationalism emerging, but during the war, the vast majority of Arab officers remained loyal to the Ottoman army from beginning to end. A very small minority defect, and you only have committed members of the pre-war secret societies actually trying to organize uh, an army under Hussein. I've written this up in a book chapter about the First World War in the Middle East, published by Ginkgo Press two years ago now. Um, but again, we're dealing with the setting of mismatched expectations in the British point of view. They didn't understand the relationships between the Arab movements uh, in the army and also in elite society with uh, Hussein, which I think were more complicated than anyone realized at the time. Lee, do you want to add to the answer to that? No, I want to ask a question. Okay. <laughs> but let's start ask for ask first. <laughs> okay. I just want to mention that the Balfour Declaration became only important uh, after it was embedded in the mandate document. Yes. I mean, uh, before it was, I will not say worthless, but I mean it was a letter uh, sent to Sir Walter Rothschild, who has no ever any international status. So really, it's only after in San Remo and later by the League of Nations, and then it was embedded as one of the articles of the mandate that it became important. This one thing. The second thing is about the Palestinian reaction to the uh, Balfour Declaration. I want to say that this reaction already started in 1980, in 19, uh, sorry, 1918, and not in 1920. And this was in, uh, let's say, implicitly confirmed by Professor Wagner, who said the British in 1980 arrive to the conclusion if we want to really implement the uh, declaration we had to use force. Thank you. Okay. Uh, who would like to respond? I guess we can all kind of cover yeah. it. Um, we can all jump in. Yeah, so I would accept both those points. I deal with all those issues in my forthcoming book. Uh, I'd say simply that, yes, there's as I mentioned towards the end, there's censorship uh, of uh, Palestinian movements by the British Army, especially during the King Crane investigations. Um, there's also Zionist intelligence cooperation with the British Army, gathering information about political organization from the armistice until the end of the mandate, actually. Um, and that contribution is cited in a number of areas is part of the reason why um, so Weizmann mobilizes that cooperation in Paris and in London to, to justify including the Balfour Declaration in the mandate. It's not the whole explanation, but uh, I think this is part of the reason why, and I was trying to make this distinction during my little presentation, that there, there's a difference between the declaration itself indeed and its inclusion into the text of the mandate. That second part has a lot to do with the way intelligence officers work with uh, Zionist interests. 
you want, can you answer? Yeah. Can I, can I add something quickly? Yeah. Now? Because I think uh, there was a very important point that Stephen and the gentleman that made about the fact that uh, the Balfour Declaration became uh, somewhat uh, uh, you know, important, which was already obviously was for the Zionists, but uh, more legally uh, binding the British with the incorporation of the Balfour Declaration within the British mandate. And I think what, what is really lacking in literature and probably that requires a lot more studies, is to, is to understand the sort of the gap, uh, the period uh, that Salim was mentioning where the, most of the Palestinians were oblivious to that. Uh, and obviously we can ask legitimate questions about what if, what would have happened if the Balfour Declaration were not, was not included into the mandate. But I think there's also the, the, the element that needs to be studied how then the Balfour Declaration was embedded into the mandate. And here we have to go look at, again, the general context as Stephen was mentioning. Of course, we have the, uh, uh, the Nibi Musa riots occurring in 1920 during the Easter celebrations. Uh, they discussed extensively that. And, and it, that is, uh, as a result of that, the British accelerated the establishment of a uh, civilian uh, government, which was not yet uh, you know, a necessity. The British were still ruling Palestine as part of a military operation under military occupation. But th that, those events, the, the Easter riots of 1920, uh, triggered uh, uh, you know, a lot of, lot of debates and, and certainly made the Zionists, and, you know, at that time you already have the agency and the strong work of Colonel Maynard Sagan uh, pushing the British uh, towards the establishment of a civilian rule. And I think that that is the moment we should work more and understand how then the Balfour Declaration was pushed into the mandate? And I think that remained somewhat of an unanswered question. Yes, actually, I want to um, uh, say something and also ask uh, Stephen about uh, the last part of his presentation. Uh, we know that within the British military command in Palestine and Transjordan, uh, there were elements who were disturbed and hostile to the for declaration, precisely because they thought it's going to put a wedge in the population and alienate the Arabs from British policy in the Middle East. We know that General Mooney, uh, uh, the uh, governor uh, stores, uh, possibly Arambi, I'm not sure, uh, and certainly Charles Ashby were, were very much hostile to the, uh, to the idea of, n not, not particularly to Zionism, but to the idea of creating a national Jewish home. And my question is, did these attitudes and reports reflect themselves in British policy at the time, and were they factors in rethinking the terms of the Balfour Declaration at the beginning of the mandate? Yeah, uh, definitely, and they help explain the haste by which they transferred from military to civil government in 1920. So General um, Mooney, for example, who's uh, in charge in Jerusalem in, um, during the military government, he doesn't, he's not exactly, uh, he's not exactly against the Zionist policy, but he does ask again and again, what is it? <laughs> um, and because the Zionist commissions knocking on the door on a bit daily basis, de making demands, Weizmann can't really act as a mediator because, and so he, there's, uh, there's this quote I've included in the book where he realizes Weizmann's dealing with a, a number of competing interests in his own party, and um, this complicates his ability to actually follow his marching orders, right? So yes, you get you have a lot of discomfort with the ambiguities of, of the wording of the Balfour Declaration itself in the army. You have discomfort with implementing some version of it or any version of it. And in some quarters, you have outright hostility. My other observation is that uh, when they do transfer to civil government, so they bring in Herbert Samuel in the summer of 1920, fine but every other important office of government, every district governor, and also the civil secretary, the chief secretary, they're all ex-staff intelligence officers from the army. So they just change their clothes. and So, so it's not really uh, a magical transformation. You still have the same type of thinking towards these problems from their point of view. Okay, many... <laughs> uh, yeah. 
there's many down here and many up there. Everybody's found their voice. Um, I want to thank you all for the great uh, lecture. Um, I think the Balfour Declaration has, um, it starts way before 1917. Um, uh, we're going to throw in the uh, London <coughs> Society for Christianizing Jews, uh, opening Christ Church in 1830s. Um, and also the, uh, oh, um, and like, I want to ask like if, if there's a, a biblical aspect to British policy towards Palestine. Uh, a biblical aspect of your answering? Or? I, 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 so it's sort of the Christian. Uh -huh. Okay, can we take some more questions? I think a lot of people feel they, that question's sort of been treated a number of yeah, times. Yeah, yeah, yeah or I don't not? mind answering, but um, that's, okay, we'll take a number of questions all in I, one go. I have a microphone. Can I make a comment? No, you comment, and a comment and a question. Um, during the early part of the British rule in, in Palestine, the officers were very much aware that they were ruling illegitimately. They, were, they knew themselves that the, the occupation administration had no legitimacy in law at that time, and they only became legitimate after, after, the, after the mandate was given by the League of Nations. Now, my next question is about clarifying some ignorance on my own part. We know that when, um, when the UN uh, passes a resolution through the, through the General Assembly, it becomes part of international law. So my question is, what was the standing of the British mandate in terms of international law at that time? Did it have the same force of power as UN resolutions today, or was it a much weaker instrument that had very little legitimacy? Okay, I've just been You're involved. Comparing, no, Excuse just a clarification by the question. You mean comparing the League of Nations terms to that of the UN? Yeah. Sorry, I've just been informed we get to take one more question and then each one of you gets a minute to respond to any of the questions. So that, uh, Albert, is it a question? <laughs> Has made a very good point. It all starts with Muhammad Ali Pasha, 1831, 1839. And the fundamentalist, the whole idea is not for the declaration. You hit it on the right record. And the whole London mission for promoting Christianity among the Jews, it was started in 1808, but it had its interpretation, you know, uh, during invasion. You can't understand this country, I think, without understanding those critical nine years of Muhammad Ali um. Okay. So now I'll turn it to the panel, who each one of you has a minute to respond yeah, to. Yeah, I'll be very brief, but uh, I think it's obviously a very important point that was made, uh, you know, to look at the biblical aspects of British policy. Uh, and to that question, I say, yes, there is a biblical aspect. No, there isn't. I think there is... Uh, a biblical aspect to it that obviously predates the Balfour Declaration, uh, Lord uh, Shaftesbury. I mean, I mean, going back at least a couple of centuries earlier, there are individuals with a vision of bringing back the Jews to Palestine uh, for their own reason, whether humanitarian or in fact because they believed in the, in the theories of Christian Zionism. But it's also very hard to see that reflect in British policy making, at least at the very uh, top end. Um, there's a lack of evidence. In a sense, we can't really prove a re religiosity uh, influence uh, policy making. Uh, Lloyd George was Welsh. We, we all know that he was coming from a non-conformist environment. He went to church, but he was also a, a very practical uh, politician. And when you look at his records, religion does not really fit into his picture. I mean, he was involved in scandals and other things. Uh, so I think there is, but it's hard to prove. And I don't think it is as strong as some people would suggest in you know, promoting the idea of a return of the Jews uh, to Eretz Israel, to the, land of, uh, to the land of the Jews. But uh, to an individual point, I think we can certainly uh, you know, add that component, but not 
in order then to write uh, a policy similar to the Balfour Declaration. And then we can have a conversation that I'm sure that we can go on and on and on. Stephen? Um, just to address the international legal question, um, I'm not sure that military governors were all that uncomfortable with what they were doing as as an occupying power. First of all, wars of conquest are perfectly legal until 1928, legal and normal. And there's a new book coming out in the States on this subject about the Kellogg-Briand Pact uh, and its impact on global peace, uh, which I'm excited to see, but uh, haven't, I've only got little extracts so far. But um, I'm no legal expert, but my, my sense is their discomfort has more to do with um, changing facts on the ground and dealing w preferentially with one community over the other, and also they find it personally annoying to deal with several very demanding groups on a day-to-day -day basis. So that's, that's my reading of the records anyway. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just a brief note about uh, Muhammad Ali. I'm glad you introduced him because Brahim Basha, when he occupied Syria, uh, his regime lasted 10 years between the, hmm? Okay, nine. <laughs> nine and a half. <laughs> he developed a pro-Christian and pro-Jewish policy at the time, a, a policy which persisted in, uh, within the ranks of the Egyptian intelligentsia and some parts of the Arab intelligentsia until the coming of Zionism. Why? Because they thought that the Jews uh, constituted, uh, European Jews in particular, constituted a modernist dimension in, in the Middle East, in creating dynamics, which they also had towards the German Templars in terms of agricultural technology. And this is something that went on, continued until people like Georges Zidane, who was very fond of uh, Zionist colonies, he thought they were modernizing schemes, and this actually also existed within parts of the Arab Muslim intelligentsia in Syria and Palestine. Uh, Zakka, for example, published a Nafir, which was a pro-Jewish paper, uh, although he was not Jewish himself. Uh, the point is that, how is this related to Balfour? It's related in the sense that uh, the, the nature of the scheming of the British in creating a Jewish national entity in cahoots with Zionism was not actually part of their cosmology. They thought that these Jews, like the Germans, were simply modernizers. And this is something that Jamal Pasha also shared with them and the CUP in Palestine until the Neely affair came, until the Jewish spy ring, which turned them against uh, the European Jewish population as part of uh, British strategy. On that very exciting note that we can't go into, thank you all very much for really these marvelous presentations. <laughs>